Hi everyone, hope you're doing great. This is really special today. I'm so excited to have a good friend, Konstantin Sukovitsky. I say a good friend, we haven't seen each other in, I can say decades, unfortunately. <laughs> in touch all throughout the years exactly that's the beautiful thing about the internet it just helps nurture you know the friendships like this i love that and before i you know leave the i don't know how you say in english leave the floor no, no i don't leave the floor before i give you the room or whatever you guys say in english i want to give um a little reminder to everyone that the music mastery experience is open for an or enrollment and you know the tagline for this i know it by memory now and i mean every word of it it's your transformational journey to loving the practice room rocking the stage winning the job of your dreams and taking your career to new heights what it is if you've never heard of it <laughs> it's a highly personalized group coaching experience three months and we start june 1st and I'm going to have you ready to rock by September. Um, so if you're looking to gain more mastery on your instrument, you want to feel empowered in the practice room, you want to feel confident in performance, you want to start seeing amazing results in your musical life, I have what you need. Um, I mean, they give you the tools to feel empowered, to go from stuck to free or shaky to confident. You're going to know how to practice and prepare for performance, no doubts. You are going to get maximal results. You're going to feel like you achieve your full potential and you're going to get this guidance to get to these powerful results. These are the tools that help me win jobs, win competitions and perform optimally in my career. Um, so you're going to progress faster, feel like you're performing at your best, feel confident. So, I don't know, if that sounds good to you, feeling empowered, confident, less stress, more fulfilled, and you want to reconnect with your love of music, because the big thing throughout all of this is this connection that we want to have with the purpose, with the love of music, with the engagement with the process itself. It's not just about the result, it's about the, I mean, the results are the journey itself as well so we don't want to lose sight of that but it's also going to help you save time if you're a busy mom or dad like me but you still need to perform at the highest level you want more results and the higher quality of life all of this are things uh, that we cover in the program and there's also an amazing group of super supportive musicians there's already several people in the program. They are amazing. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get started to work with all of these amazing people. And they're going to give you this motivation, this accountability, the inspiration. So, you know, if this is something that sounds good to you, you're looking to take things to the next level and have optimal performance time after time and enjoy the journey on the way there, go to mindoverfinger.com find all the details there book your free conversation with me and let's make it happen so there's everything you need to walk on stage or in the audition room fully confident and if you're a student uh, if you're a teacher you're going to be able to give all of these tools to your students so um yeah i call this the high performance toolkit so anyway if this is something that sounds good to you again go to mindoverfinger.com mme Book your free call and together let's see if it's a good fit for you and uh, i'm actually going to put the link right here thank you for sitting through this constantine my pleasure it sounds <laughs> interesting i love it and i love the name too mind over finger thank you i i spent a lot of time thinking about that oh hi sarah hi suzanne so okay enough about me constantine can you please tell us a little bit about you, how your journey unfolded and how all of this, you know what, I'm gonna put you right here in the center. Here we go, love it. Okay. Well, um, so it began, in America, it unfolded just when we met, you and I, 22 years ago in Santa Barbara at the Academy of the West, which was where I came directly from Moscow. Um, 
which was the summer before my freshman year at Juilliard. And um, I mean, my, my, my story obviously began in Moscow, Russia, which is where I'm born uh, and from and spent the first 18 years of my life. And I was always, um, I was double majoring in piano and composition and music theory. But besides that, I was always kind of um, inclined to branch out. So while I was in the Moscow Central Special School, you know, as a pianist and a composer, you know, very serious Beethoven sonatas, getting ready for competitions and stuff like that. You know, I was singing pop at a uh, Russian, um, it was called Factory for Stars type of thing. Um, I was acting in theater. I was anchoring children's news on weekends on television. So I was always sort of a showbiz. I always said I felt like a showbiz uh, personality in a classical musician's body. And then um, when I showed up at Juilliard, I discovered that actually you couldn't really do anything but at the time just concentrate on, on the craft of your, you know, real serious focus, which generally speaking is what we should all do. But I think ironically, it was a little bit ahead of the curve because right now, Everyone is doing what I was doing 20 years ago, and in fact, it's taught. You know, the, I think there is a new term now called portfolio career, you know, doing all these things. But when I really was doing them, most people weren't really getting, why would I even bother do anything but practice and, you know, listen to classical music? Uh, so, um, so that's in short my journey, because right now, and all these years later, I mean, I'm an ancient 40 year old. And so, so, you know, I, um, I'm enjoying the career as a performer, right? As a concert pianist, as a composer, as a lyricist, as an actor, as a producer, um, as an educator, obviously I teach, but I developed my own uh, system called narrative musicianship, which is acting technique adapted for instrumental musicians uh, where you don't have words to say but you have to create narrative and act it out. And in, in, in it, we really dig into approaching music as um, an actor studies a script. So I have everybody literally mark up the score as an actor, not with musical terms, but with kind of notes to find the script, if actor's any good, not in the soaps, perhaps. Uh, so anyway, sorry, I don't need to be. <laughs> so it's coffee that's doing it, you see? So um, that is essentially, um, a result of my early on uh, interest in other things outside of uh, just narrow uh, field of uh, playing piano. And I'm sure all of these activities fuel each other. Absolutely. I, I mean, the, the, the more I do what I do, the more interested in it I become. Yeah. But some, you have to have a third party perspective. So um, my interest in music usually is triggered by literature or a play or or some just random thought. I'm a super science nut. I mean, I watch, I don't read fiction anymore. I mean, I just read scientific and medical articles all the time. <laughs> like I watch, you know, how to split an atom type documentaries. Like I'm just into it. I think in an alternative reality, I would probably in another life, I would have been a scientist in robotics or something because I'm really fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. I love it. I have gadgets. I use them all the time. Um, and, and I get a lot of inspiration from it. In fact, it's, it's the human versus the machine that makes the human matter. Right. Oh, this is so inspiring. It's really amazing. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the class that you're giving at Juilliard because that was one of the questions that we got in. Um, oh, and I forgot to write down who sent that. I think it was Darlene. Was it you, Darlene? She was wondering if you could talk about the interpretation enhancement course narrative musicianship based on Russian acting method <laughs> that you're teaching at the Juilliard School and share some of your thoughts on interpretation. Absolutely. So uh, we actually, I taught the pilot course this fall semester at Juilliard's evening division. Uh, I'm teaching a different course in the summer there, um, the Russian piano miniatures, but uh, hopefully I'll do that again because this is a course that is designed for advanced players, right? Professionals, or it can be amateurs. There were a couple of people who were really not, you know, by day job musicians, but who were very advanced. You have, to, in order to benefit from it, you have to be able to play well, right? Because if you're like struggling with 
um, music you can you can probably benefit from from the concepts but the course is geared at you know one-on-one -on -one coaching essentially mm -hmm. with with actual music performance but uh in short term elevator pitch it's um you know the the famous method that lee strasberg um brought really uh, from my namesake Konstantin stanislavsky from Mm -hmm. Moscow, Stanislavski was a famous uh, actor and director and all, had, had his own theater. In fact, theater still is in Moscow. It's called Stanislavski in the mirror of Danchenko theater, which is sort of where all the Chekhov's plays were debuted, right? So um, uh, it's, it's a very um, profound way of looking um, at crafts as an actor where you become the character, right? You analyze, you, you're, you're present in that character's inner world, which is a fully realized 3D experience. So the idea is to not pose, but to live. Yes. But in order to do that, yes. you, have to, um, you have to understand the process. So you can't just say, okay, I'm gonna live now and do what, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, so there, there is a, a system to living, if you will which is essentially self-analysis. You have to analyze yourself and the world around you to understand the impulse of human behavior and human emotion, understand where it comes from. And then um, find, when you look at the character as a method actor, you ask them all those questions, but then you have to find sympathetic experiences in your own real self, right? In your actual life. And most, there's always a way. They may not be exactly the same. I mean, hopefully, because most of the, yeah, Dramatic acting has to do with some tragedy of sorts. So, you know, one hopes that those personal experiences are not as tragic as those of those characters. Mm -hmm. yes. But there's always something you can find. I mean, we've all lost somebody, right? Even if it's your cat, uh, right? So that's already an experience of loss. So you mm -hmm. can recall that emotion. And in the process of recalling that emotion, it becomes true to you again, or you relive it. And then you assign it to the character. So you're able to snap into the character who was mourning a loss of a parent or a child. But what you, what you in reality, mourning a loss of your cat from 25 years ago, you're just able to be emotionally right there instantly. And then you're no longer faking it, right? Your tears aren't uh, put on tears. You're actually crying for your cat. Uh, I mean, it's a very sort of simplistic example. <laughs> but you understand, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. There's a zillion of these things. So you, the entire universe is woven out of it, right? Our sensory memory, you know, we all know smell. You know, what does the air smell like in a place where you spend the night with your first lover? Husband, wife, right? Yeah. Um, that can be very powerful. Do you remember? everybody? If, if everybody thinks about it, I'm sure they will remember. But just people don't think about it. But you can use it as an actor or as a musician, as a storyteller, right? When you're playing a piece, that's one of my favorite things to say to people um, is just, you have to contextualize your entire performance beyond just playing music and playing notes. You know, try to smell the air of the imaginary place where your character is playing the piece you're playing. And that will determine the way your sound will be, the way your breathing will be, the way your energy will flow. Darlene just put in here, do you channel the composer when considering interpretation? Uh, not the composer, um, because it's a two-edged sword. There are composers that are very autobiographical and there are composers that are not. And I think, I mean, in the system, there is a, the, it's very important to do research, right? So it all begins with your activation of your brain. So we have to research, research, research. And um, so in order to create your own narrative for it to make any sense, it has to be, um, it has to be tangibly within the probability of what the composer meant with to save their music, right? Was, because if you just put things completely out of context, it can become absurd, right? So any system like this can be taken and flipped on itself and it can become just an absurd exercise of surrealism you know you take Bach and you turn it into I don't know um, a, a disco song right mm -hmm. you don't want to do that unless that is the point of what you're doing but that then becomes performance art not the performing arts do you know what I mean right um, if you're if, if your idea is to search for the truth of the mean, uh, the meaning of the music you're playing the research and understanding of um, 
what composer likely was saying with that music uh, will give you the initial intel from which you build, right? And that is actually usually determined not by reading their, uh, you know, musical biography, but by discovering the kind of people they were with at the time. Letters are very good because letters are really gossip columns of the day, mm -hmm. right? So that's where we get really dirt in everybody. And, but you can also get an understanding of their attitude towards people, towards things. So, uh, you know, read the letters, see who they were friends with, see what music they were listening to, what art were they, uh, you know, surrounded by. Because a lot of music is, I mean, all of art is actually reactionary, right? It's either in consort with the events or the zeitgeist of the time or against it. Right. Right. The, the WC, you know, the Impressionists were anti-Wagnerians. Well, guess what? What's really funny is that if you look at the Valkyrie, it's basically Tedeas and Melisande. I mean, so Debussy's opera is so Wagnerian from orchestration to through composition of it. I mean, it's really extraordinary. But, and yet, uh, Debussy spent his whole life, you know, basically flinging dirt at Wagner. So, those kinds of things give you clues as to what might be going on in the composer's mind. But then in order for you for one, to give a believable performance, you have to make it yours. And Stanislavski always said, the moment the actor says lines, he is a co-author of the play. Mm, I love that. Take ownership of the music. The moment you play anybody's music, you're co-composing it. But without a performer, music is dead. It's just a bunch of black ink on a, on a piece of paper. We bring it alive. And, and it's not just privilege. It's a responsibility to, to mean what we say and it has to have meaning to us because if you're just constantly role-playing trying to pretend that you're in 18th century you're just a glorified undertaker mm -hmm. you know we can be embalming music we have to make it current we have to live in order for it to breathe it has to be live and it has to be adapted to 21st century so yes you can create narratives that involve cars and gadgets and computers and it's perfectly all right and you're playing in Mozart concerto this is so fascinating. I feel like I have about 10 questions coming to my head. And there's an, something I'm thinking about. I'll get back to this in a second. But what's interesting to me is how um, I haven't heard often about musicians using acting methods. And I use acting methods in the Music Mastery Experience before a different approach. Um, but recently, there was a podcast episode with Eli Epstein, where he was also talking about using the Stanislavski method. Do you find that at times people... So for me, it's interesting to have, you know, two people close in, in within a few weeks having a, a not similar, but, you know, somewhat similar approach. And... Um, but do you find that at times people have a hard time reconciling the emotions in the narrative with the music that they're trying to interpret? Well, absolutely. But it happens usually from not being precise enough. Mm -hmm. Right. So I always, you know, I always say, mm. yeah, um, you know, all I do is lecture people. Uh, but <laughs> I find that the more precise your narrative, you're creating it yourself, right? So you're in control of the kind of emotion you're creating also. So if, if people are saying, I'm just going to, you know, this is a heartbreak. Well, that's a very broad stroke. You know, what is a heartbreak? Exactly what form does it take? I mean, are you a man or a woman? The wonderful thing about this, it can be complete role playing in a sense that you can flip genders. You can, you can be old, you can be young in your, because th th those details, remain your secret, right? That's another sort of um, actor device is that you really never divulge that. I mean, obviously we do in a class in order to learn uh, in order, mm -hmm. and I do in order to demonstrate to people. But in, in my real performance, I never ever reveal my inner narrative because it can be, well, it can seem very um, remote from the music for the audience. The important thing is what it does to me so that I can interpret better. It doesn't have, it, it doesn't have to be public knowledge. So whatever you find that actually creates the right emotion and you're in control of is the right narrative, not the other way around. 
people can control their emotions when they're really not constructing a, a narrative, not writing a script in their mind, but just going by, I'm happy, I'm unhappy, you know, I'm in love, I, now I'm, you know, single, right? Those things, is, they have so many different ways of being that that's where you can be overwhelmed with emotions, you may not know what to do. And then what highly trained professionals do, they default into pretty playing, right? You just kind of yeah. play pretty music at people. Well, you know, that's that's where the audience starts checking their email. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, I love what you said at the beginning in terms of how you need to already be in control of the instrument. Because at times I find that an issue that some people are facing, and I hope I do a good job of expressing what I'm trying to say right now is that people want to express and therefore they don't want to feel like as they're playing they're executing a bunch of different commands but at the base of things you need to know what the commands are so you can create the crescendo or um, I don't play piano but you know you need to know what the mechanics are so that you get precisely the kind of attack that you want. So I find that people at times have a resistance to think of interpretation as also a very technical thing. But the beauty is that you need to understand all of the technical things, then you can move on to the narrative. But I find that at times people have somewhat of a resistance to really push the technical approach of being able to execute it. Am I making any sense? Oh, absolutely. Look, I mean, I think what you're really saying is that um, just like with the ballet dancing, right, in order to be Martha Graham's and Nuria's, you know, you have to be that good first, right? So if your body doesn't bend and if you can be airborne for 15 minutes and all those wonderful things that we associate with the top ballet and then emotions are capable of being um, interpreted, because playing a classical instrument of any sort, piano, violin, um, at that professional level is like an Olympic sport, right? You have to start early and you have to do it consistently throughout your life. Otherwise, your body just evolves without including that ability, right? It's, it's very physical. You know, your ligaments are less flexible. Your tendons don't work. You know, your, your micromusculature in your fingers doesn't respond to brain because there is no neural pathways mm -hmm. that have been created. So um, that is a prerequisite. On the other hand, you, one can reverse engineer it and say, well, you know, if you're not aiming at being a professional, then no matter what level you are, if you start using this kind of approach, it will make your experience of your music making that much more pleasurable, that much more adventurous. Yeah. You know, students who are just spending hours and hours and hours writing multiple scripts because they're into it all of a sudden like they discovered something they're discovered meaning of what they're doing yes they may not be Carnegie Hall quality of a performance but their experience of their music uh, making is elevated and and they're sort of looking for things and thinking about things differently so that's that's the goal and for kids you know visual aids and all those things are great so if you're dealing with children I was just talking about this the other day with um it, educator who predominantly works with younger people and they were interested in, in narrative musicians. I said, well, you know, mo mainly I deal with, you know, heartbreak deaths and adult, you know, working with grownups. So you don't want to scare the kids by talking about death all the time. But there, but on the other hand, you know, you can give, they can create their own stories, right? You just give them essentially, you know, opportunity and, and, and it's license to go and write their fairy tales. And then you teach them how that can become the basis for their music playing. Yes. Oh, and I love that you use the word adventurous. Well, it has to be, look, I mean, life and music is a blessing, but can be also incredibly boring if one isn't adventurous. I mean, just hours and hours of repeating the same things over and over again, it doesn't sound very exciting to me. Unless you make it so, it can be also incredible. So it's kind of what, well, it's in, in the way you approach the process. And it's a real cycle, too, when you're adventurous, you're curious. I believe you use the word engaged as well, which is a word I love when it comes to music making, being engaged. And then you look for new ways of interpretation. You start experimenting more on the instrument. And like that elevates the skills as well as the creativity. It's just beautiful. 
the ultimate goal is of technique is to not think about it, right? So, so then your ability to play your chosen instrument is such that um, you think the concept and your body executes it yeah. at a high level. Because if you think, oh, what I do with the left finger, where does the pedal go? And like, where am I? Like that's, it's not, you, you can't go to that next level. Like, imagine if an actor like doesn't know their lines by heart. I mean, would you be interested in going to Broadway and seeing everybody read from the script? Probably not, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Against a real comedy. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of these, like, you have to just be prepared. Yeah. And, and in, in case of uh, classical music, it just takes years. Oh my God, we never stop really, you know, learning more. Yeah. But I'd say, you know, about 10 years into your uh, music journey, you, if you practice right, and if you have great teachers to guide you, because uh, there is no one fits all, you know, there, everybody's hands are different. Everybody's body is different, ability, coordination. So in purely technical study, there has to be very good and careful guidance uh, rather than, you know, do it my way or, or you're no good. Right. Uh, that rigid approach. That's why I don't like the ideas of schools, you know, Russian school, German school. I mean, what is that? You know, um, there's only one school, good music. Mm. And, and you know whichever way you get to make it good for you all right so yes. um we have to be an aggregate of things mm. so, you know i had russian school and german school and american school and then you know put it all together into bula bays and uh, i'm going to the constantine school <laughs> well yeah i'm sure somebody will call it that one day and and fine but I, that's not the goal the goal is to be to have the biggest number of um, tools at, at my disposal so that I don't have to think about how to make something happen, but just make it happen, right? Yes. Then your attention is on envisaging what's going to happen, right? Your imagination is working towards emotional truth as opposed to how do I accommodate because I can't play double notes. Absolutely. Or I need to slow down here because it gets difficult and I have another 15 minutes of a piece left. You know, you don't want to have those things predetermine your interpretation and your way of playing. Absolutely. Ideally. Th this is kind of connected to a question I see here. In, I see Siliana saying imagery is so important. Yes. And you know, in the music mastery experience, one way that I use the acting method is also to address performance anxiety, how we feel when we play. And because feelings are created by thoughts. So it is possible to put ourselves in the state that we desire before performance. And some of these acting methods, I find are very effective to, to do that. It is possible to backstage channel joy and put yourself in a state of joyful gratitude. Um, so anyway, th these are some ways that I use these acting methods. Um, so Darlene says, do you recommend kind of connected to what you just said, do you recommend listening to recordings before working on a new piece? Um, yes and no. Good question. Two answers. Depends on you. If you are um, automatically uh, starting to emulate what you like, and other, there are two kinds of personalities, I think. The, ones, the, the inadvertent copycats, as it were, and uh, um, and uh, kind of detached listeners. So if you're able to listen to them and like gather intel, mm -hmm. one thing, but if you immediately fall in love and it starts rubbing off on you, then maybe not until after you've already created something of your own, because that's the danger of sounding like Arthur Rubenstein, uh, mm -hmm. which is what I actually did when I was younger. <laughs> uh, I was so obsessed with Arthur Rubenstein and, um, historic recordings, but particularly Rubenstein of all. Uh, so in my early years at Juilliard, I just started, I wasn't intentionally copying him, but I was just listening to him all the time. And all of a sudden everybody starts telling me, look, you know, you sound like Rubenstein, which is not the worst thing on earth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> those were mannerisms though, you know, those were like a particular rubato, the particular things. And, and I would listen to myself, my recordings, and I was like, wait, wait a second, yeah, I kind of do. Uh, and then for a while I thought, oh, that's cool. 
and then and then I realized, well, you know, I'm losing myself. You know, I really don't know what I want to play like because I'm just playing in a Rubenstein mode. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. yes, that's, that's a difficult uh, choice to make. I these days I like to not listen to when when I'm just starting to learn a piece. Like for instance, I. Uh, pandemic had postponed my debut performance of Brahms second piano concerto, mm -hmm. something I wanted to do for many, many years, played myself. I have heard it over the years live actually many times, but uh, you know, that wasn't when I was learning it. So I have memory of my emotional response to those performances, but I'm not verbatim listening to them. And so I first learned it on my on my own with my own and then implemented my own, my own ideas, written my own script, marked up my score, you know, done all that work. And then I started listening. Um, and interestingly that once you do that and you listen to other people, it's not that you don't like any of the other interpretations, but it yours always wins. Mm. That's how it should be. If we constantly try to, uh, emulate our idols we carry with us on stage the perpetual inferiority complex yeah because we know we aren't as great as Rubenstein just because he was he is that um and famous do you know what I mean so if you're if you're trying to be Heifetz or you know Dmitry Korostovsky um then you're always underperforming uh right uh when you create your own interpretation and you believe in it entirely you listen to other people you say oh that's beautiful but um, I, would, I would do it other otherwise and so it becomes i think more of a constructive listening uh as opposed to just uh looking for um insta borrow yes i see another note here from siliana she was talking she was wondering what you think about tobman tobman technique i think so yes uh, the um, the rotation of the wrist is that it? Um, I think so. Um, look, I think wrist has to be flexible. So again, I don't believe in employing a technique because, frankly, everybody who is a true, absolute disciple of Taubman technique uh, develops hand problems uh, too. So I think there is some truth to it, and it's good to incorporate into your technique some of its principles but you can't play you know Prokofiev second piano concerto if you follow strictly Taubman technique you just can't period because your fingers need to be like this mm. um, to play to reach the kind of poise you need to reach um and so the, so it, it's custom you know everything i always say we're in hot couture business everything's bespoke there is no of the rack <laughs> yes you know what I mean? it, you it, it's make everything yeah so i'm not a pianist but in violin playing, we often hear about, you know, the bow should be held this way, or you have people who are strong proponent, proponents that musician, uh, violinists shouldn't play with a shoulder rest, or other people say they shouldn't play without. So I think that ultimately, it goes back to what you were saying also about interpretation, is how do you make it your own? How do you make it work for yourself? Yeah, but the most important thing also is health. You have to be healthy. So tension is number one pillar. Of, of hand health, right? Notice those exercise balls over there, right? Mm -hmm. I'm constantly uh, doing exercises against the wall and, and rolling and finding relaxations and 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 um, I'm working actually with a specialist to develop a particular uh, body uh, awareness and uh, exercise routine that is geared at pianists who will sit because most of that stuff is um, geared at people who are standing up. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but it's very interesting because really the only thing that matters uh, long, uh, long term is that your hands are healthy and that you have a lifetime of usage uh, at high uh, intensity level, which means you have to relax. Whenever there is a tension that is built, something is wrong then. And it's, it's multiple reasons it can be. I don't want to guess the specifics. But but you should never feel uncomfortable playing the piano, or, or you should never feel any type of tension or uh, pain. And that can come from certain techniques. Some techniques can help, but again, if you stick to a very strict, this is how you do it. It's like everybody's like, hold an apple. Well, great if you're playing, you know, 
maybe Baroque music, but you can't hold a nipple while playing, you know, Rachmaninoff piano concerto. Mm -hmm. You can't. Um, so, you know, use the reasonable judgment. And again, body awareness is a very important thing. You know, we are all different proportions, right? So what is good for one person simply is opposite for somebody else because their, you know, hands to shoulder ratio is different. Right. Yes. Josephine talked uh, about performance and she was wondering if you have a routine before performance, uh, a checklist of certain things you must do to put yourself into the performance mindset. Of course. Um, checklist. That's actually a good idea. I should make, make one. Uh, yeah, I always check to make sure my flies up. Um, <laughs> no, it actually wants I was wearing something uh, red and black and I forgot to zip up and took a bow and saw it and I was like, oh my God, they're having fun now. Um, but seriously, uh, yes, I do. And that's where, you know, I've been experimenting on myself for 20 years plus uh, with narrative musicianship. So before I kind of coined it into a system, I was just doing random, um, you know, exercises and things. First of all, breathing is so important. You know, I do breathing exercises to just calm down because actually the emotion comes out of your body, right? So we think emotion is something that occurs in our soul, but uh, emotion occurs in your body. So if your body sends, sends the wrong signal, you can be thinking pleasant thoughts. But if you're, uh, you know, uh, for instance, have the wrong posture, your body thinks this is being attacked. So your body is actually in flight or fight mode. So you mm -hmm. can be recognized thoughts, but your body is doing physically opposite to you. So you have to find a ways to, you know, nap, relax fully from inside out, from the body and then into the mind. So assuming, you know, there are certain, I mean, all the Feldenkrais, Alexander, they're all talking about the same thing. You know, body scan, just kind of lay down and feel different parts of your body. And if you can lay down, you can do it standing up. If you can stand up, you know, you can do it, just concentrate on feeling, you know, your feet, your shoulders, your midsection, your neck, uh, then, um, I mean, I always, you know, I have narratives going, right? So I'm always kind of play acting, right? So I'm getting myself into the character, what I'm going to do. Sometimes I listen to music that isn't at all what I'm going to play, but something that inspires me, mm -hmm. uh, which can range from Mozart to Madonna. So that depends on what I'm playing. Um, for instance, when I played the uh, Prokofiev Second Concerto, uh, I call it the um, rise of the machine. My narrative for it is the distraction of humanity through um, the industrialization in the early mm -hmm. 20th century. So I watched Terminator backstage. That puts me into the right frame of everything, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm able to channel the horror of Terminator. Yeah. It's like for me, I have a, a routine that before each big audition, I watch the first four Rocky movies every time. <laughs> oh, it's also, I mean, the oldest technique is, 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 um, is you know, the personality is flip, is where uh, you basically impersonate your favorite movie star. Mm. Mm -hmm. So essentially, or I mean, can be musician, uh, you know, in other words, instead of feeling like you're you and you're being judged uh, by somebody, imagine that you were someone that is, um, you know, in zenith of their global fame and, um, and everyone is just so lucky to breathe the same air in their, with their presence. No one is judging you. Everybody just wants a piece of you, an autograph, and that gives you confidence uh, to carry yourself like a star. And then people, if you believe it, people will believe it. And if you, if you have an ounce of apology, oh my God, you know, that's it. You lost them. Mm -hmm. Then you're a student that is being adjudicated. That's a good point. It's like I was saying, feelings, they're all caused by thoughts that were yeah, yeah. entertaining. Okay, it's kind of the easiest in a way. It's maybe this overly simplistic, but, you know, just imagine you are your idol. Mm -hmm. and, um, that That is their performance. That just, you're, you're playing it. But, and are you are you like me where I find that my pre-performance rituals they actually starts at home uh, weeks before a performance you know, with visualization and just uh, pre-start techniques and things like this? I mean, look, before you know time 
stopped a year ago. Uh, you know, I was doing it quite often. So, I mean, I don't, I can go, you know, if, into a performance state, you know, within an hour. So, mm -hmm. because I can't, I, I like to really have a life to work balance. So mm -hmm. I don't think about uh, performances or, or anything musical 24 seven. I just don't think it's healthy. So, you know, I snap in and out of it. Yeah. So I don't do it much in advance, but I do have, um, I mean, I do have ways that, uh, again, thought process, uh, techniques, inspiration is very important to me. Like I, which are usually filmed because, you know, because I act. So for me, acting is where I really get all of it. So mm -hmm. like the day of my Lincoln Center debut, I just spend the whole morning in bed watching the hours because I was playing music uh, from the film. But in order for me to embody the music, um, you know, I, I watched the whole movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so those kind, but you have to find them. There's no absolutely unique thing, you know, somebody needs to eat chocolate then eat chocolate you know i don't like to eat anything before <laughs> performance because i love food and i like you know mercurial things in life so if i'm eating i want to have wine and champagne and then you know then you're really not in performance mode so i'm glad you mentioned chocolate because that's one of my thing i do as well years ago i think i came up with this um uh, what would you call it a theory that if there's adrenaline and I eat chocolate, my body is busy digesting the sugar. <laughs> so, well, and, and I'm talking, this was, you know, when I was in my late teens. So this is a habit I've had many years. But when I'm talking about pre-performance routines at home, I'm talking more in the practice room, not as I cook or things like this. Well, I mean, it's very important. I'm, I'm always, first of all, I always have to be warmed up. Mm -hmm. uh, so your body has to be flexible, right? So play the piano or you can do some stretching whatever the my worst thing is cold like if if the weather around me is cold my hands are getting cold then i really don't feel comfortable then uh you know so i always have gloves everywhere so i just make sure my hands are sort of neutrally warm and um depending on the piece you know that i'm playing if, usually if it's a solo show i just that's very natural uh, to me when I'm playing with an orchestra, you know, it's, 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 it's a little different and depending on a concerto, you know, it literally, literally goes from, uh, you know, watching Terminator to, uh, reading the score yeah. uh, to, you know, visualizing, um, usually I, you know, I already have a narrative, so I'm trying to get myself as close to the narrative. The important thing I always say, you know, to everybody is, right before your performance begins before you step on stage right it's it's when you're in the wings and um as you're standing there instead of thinking oh my god am i gonna remember everything or i'm nervous or i'm not nervous i'm joy you know you can just refocus your mind on saying who are you as a kid who is your character playing that piece mm -hmm. Whoever it is. who are you where are you where have you come from why are you here and where are you going afterwards? Occupy yourself with those things. It will give you purpose and it will take the nervousness away. And it, cre it creates in your energy a life lived. Because all those things, they determine already a 3D environment. You're not, you know, a carbon copy of a thought or mm -hmm. an idea. You're an entity, a living being that is, has an agenda, has text and subtext. So everything you're playing half of it is not what it sounds like. Right. What is it? Then subtext. It's like the words that actors, the characters are saying are never what they really mean. Yeah. Does you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Same thing. So start thinking about that. Then you, your whole body changes because you're interested. You're trying to feel that and you forget you're even performing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do usually. I say, you know, how old am I today? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not kidding you. Uh, I have a lots of, uh, I, I have multiple narratives for, for everything. So depending on how I feel, you know, I have to vibe with it. So in order for it to be real, right? So I may not always have a very stiff predetermined narrative for one piece. I have variants. And um, based on my feeling of the day, um, I can flip between them. And then, you know, sometime... I'm a 16 year old boy. Sometimes I'm a woman in her sixties. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm 
somebody who just had a breakup. Uh, sometimes I'm, I don't know, pregnant. Uh, the sky's the limit. So long as you try to feel what what that person would feel if they were you, mm-hmm. and what that me, uh, music, how it relates to them, right? So it sounds a little random when I give those examples. Yeah. But, but it's not actually really random because it's not just funky for the sake of being funky, right? There's, once you have a narrative, uh, for instance, like I use Brahms Intermezzo, you know, number two from uh, uh, 117, um, is, is when you, it's, it's aging, right? My character, one thing that is consistent is that the character um, begins his life um, as a sort of hopeful young person, you know, full of excitement about things. And then as they go through life, their experiences dull the feelings. Mm-hmm. And then there is a sense, then they clearly meet somebody uh, because there is a duet with an imitation. So, you know, that's where the an- analysis comes in, right? You don't want to lose that or disregard that. So clearly that dramatically introduces a second entity into that narrative. So it's their partner in life. Whoever that is, it's up to you. Man, woman, it doesn't matter. And um, and then that meeting affects how that person experienced life up to that point. Because music returns, but it returns differently. So now you have impression of that other person on you and your personality. And then you age. And then there's a sense of passage of time. Then there's a sense of regret. And then there is a, so usually I age them to almost death. And then at the final phrases, that's where I have a variant where based, if I feel like killing them, then I do. Yeah. Yeah. And it ends really tragically, but it can also end so hopefully. And if I don't feel like I'm, you know, in a state where uh, my battery went out. Uh, <laughs> the death of the character is the right state for today. Then I don't. Then I have this variant that I flip to, and and then it's um, then it becomes very hopeful. It's like you know, one door closes, the other door opens. There is a rebirth at the end, as opposed to finality. I love all of the creativity that comes from doing this. I can also hear. A question from and I'm thinking of a particular person that would have this question do you ever feel like do you ever show up with no narrative just 100% Constantine in this moment um that's a good question I know I always have narratives yeah because look I mean first of all I'm you I've I've had narratives probably my whole life because you're you can <laughs> script yourself. Me, when I'm performing, is not me doing dishes in the kitchen. And uh, do you know what I mean? Like, you're just different uh, in a different state and frame of being. So it's there. It's not like you're hiding from yourself by being uh, in, in the narrative. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if, if you want to narrativize yourself, um, absolutely. I really love uh, playing other characters and other roles, but you know, that's unfair because I've acted and I've played other characters, so I know how to do it and I enjoy doing it. Mm-hmm. Or musicians, for instance, who've never acted, you know, this may seem like, you know, kind of a distracting tall order. Then absolutely you can create narrative that superimposes onto you and your story and your actual actuality, your feelings and your, um, you know, life events and uh, work with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing I loved as well was how you mentioned that, and I'm using different words, but how you're not limited by your narrative. It's just a yeah, well, starting I mean, point of inspiration, but is open to all sorts of... Nothing should ever be limited. Because mm-hmm. the idea of a good artist is the limitless expression. Yeah. So, uh, by no means is the system supposed to put a cage over, you know, your your construct and say, you know, this is what you do. The beauty of it is that it's it's no one knows, right? It's in your consciousness. Yes. Yeah. 
your head, but nobody knows. It's not a program note. And please don't, don't ever really put it in program note. Um, because you may be an animal or an object uh, in your narrative. I mean, it is possible. You know, how many times I played water or sun. Uh, I mean, you know, if you actually tell people, they'll think you're nuts. <laughs> so, uh, but if it works for you, if it gives your sound warmth, if, if you can embody sun and what it means to people across millennia of history. I mean, that, there's a lot to unpack there, right there. But you, in fact, may be channeling sun. So there's a lot um, to be said about the fact that it's secret. So it can evolve, it can change. And if, if you're, look, we should be ever so lucky to feel that our narratives constrict us. Yes. Usually it's the other way around. We, we don't yes. Have enough, uh, details. So I always, almost without a, exception, every time when my students bring me the script uh, of their music, there are like 60% voids that need to be filled in. Yeah. Uh, even though after they thought they had marked it up, right? Yeah. There's never enough information. So I don't think there's a, I will be delighted to encounter when there is too much. Yeah. And you know what I love about this too, is that it separates us from our self-concept as Renee, as a person, I am this way, I am this way, I am this way. When I grant myself permission to be anyone and anything, then the possibilities are endless. Of course. And, and the, the, the idea is, is, is to also get out of your own mind, right? Get out of your own head. We all have little quirks and, and insecurities. And, and if it's you, 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 you know, you're kind of self-centered that way. And, um, and, and those things can be, come into focus quite a lot, you know? Yeah. There's no one who's a super person. No one has ever not, not had anxieties. I mean, if they were saying so, they were just not being honest. Right. Uh, so let's, you know, admit that, get over it, celebrate it. But then, you know, in a way, I find that, um, you know, acting um, those narratives out through music is ultimate, you know, serving of the music because you're not serving yourself or your ego in the sense that you're doing it all because of you you kind of lose yourself in what is the authenticity of the story you're telling. And that's, again, that goes back to uh, research, research, research. If your basis of your story is really off, then this entire construct is, is, a, is a house of cards because you're building it on the wrong foundation. It has to be tangibly probable as far as what composer meant and what composers impulse to compose the music would be about then all of this will enrich it and serve the purpose of that composer but if 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 the whole thing is not organic then it can get you know pretty weird there's a, i see another question here and then i'm gonna have to go very soon but when you aren't certain about your interpretation do you experiment with different characters but i think you've answered this question in the yeah, I, I'm, you know, currently working on something, and I'm not certain yet. So I just keep doing it until it's right. And it's you know when it's right. That research you're talking about. Right, right, and also in trial and error. You know, just play it from a different spot. Uh, you know, how many times I played something as though I'm seducing somebody, and then it doesn't work. And then I'm, you know, okay, I'm going to play it as though I am being seduced by somebody from the outside, or or am I am I a child or am I grown up? You know, just that can take hours. You know in the moment where the hair in the back of your neck starts standing up and you have uncontrollable tears going down your face. That's when it's working. Mm. And I have spent many hours silently weeping here. So I know, and this is not bragging, but that's my check. Like if I am uncontrollably moved by what I'm hearing, that means I'm getting it. Mm. That's the answer. Constantine, this is so amazing. And I really hope that you and I see each other soon, very, very soon. Before I let you go, I would love for you to give us a quick actionable tip that we could implement today in our musical lives. Well, this actually uh, grows out of what I mentioned earlier. Right before you play, um, determine, determine who you are, meaning as a protagonist, is this music? Are you, 
Are you somebody who, 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 who's bringing peace or war? Are you after something or, or are you um, responding, reacting to something, right? So those things are usually uh, very important determining, determining factors for the energy of how you start, right? Uh, of your music. And then um, another thing is uh, feel your environment. Like, is it winter or spring? Uh, is the air warm and do you feel it on your skin? Or, or is it cold and you have big fur color and you, you can see vapor coming out of your uh, you know, air when you exhale? Those details, as unrelated, seemingly unrelated as they are, will immediately put you in the scene of where the music should begin. Hmm. And, and I mean, I use that all the time. Never just sort of say, oh, I'm on the stage and I have to start playing. Never start playing. The playing is a sound manifestation of, of living that's already happening. Right? The music is already sounding. If you just think about it, I usually do that before I start. Don't begin at the beginning. Hear the first two bars in your imagination as you're sitting there on stage, you know, about to begin playing. And then start breathing in that tempo and enter as though you're joining that inner sound that you're visualizing then the entrance will be just so organic. It'll come out of something. It'll be meaningful. I love this. Konstantin, you've just given me, and I'm sure many other people here, food for thoughts and inspiration for weeks to come. And so great. I would love for us to have many more hours to discuss all of this. I'm so grateful that you took the time to come and sit with me this morning. And it's so wonderful to see you. My pleasure. It's wonderful to see you. and, and Thank you all for watching. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thanks for being here. Bye.